We can start? All right. So, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Nikos Deligianis. Uh, I am professor of machine learning and AI at uh, VUB at the university next door. And also, uh, I am uh, affiliated with uh, IMEC, an institute in Brussels uh, on microelectronics and data science. Uh, you will see uh, my information, contact information on the, on the slide, um, including my Twitter account, um, email account, and, and uh, my homepage. So the, the talk of today, yeah, the talk of today, will, yes, the talk of today, uh, the topic of today's talk will be on uh, graph analytics for big data, uh, especially how we can explore graphical structure in data, structure that it is normally present uh, in uh, this kind of uh, data. Uh, to be able to perform advanced analytics by respecting the, the fact that data typically live on a graph. So, I will start firstly by introducing some uh, basic concepts about uh, graphs. graphs. Uh, specifically, what do we consider graphs and what are the characteristics of graphs. But before I do that, I would like to uh, tell you that uh, actually graphs are uh, every are present every um, in every uh, aspect of our lives. Uh, actually, you can consider uh, that uh, data from smart grids, they um, or from any electrical system or from any electrical grid, uh, they live on a graph. Uh, the connection between uh, the nodes in, in uh, such a system. Uh, alternatively, uh, we move in a city or we move in a street network, right? Uh, all of these uh, coordinates uh, of streets, they formulate a graph, okay? They formulate uh, a system of nodes and vertices, uh, nodes and edges, as we will see later on. Uh, environmental data, including temperature, humidity, uh, weather data, they can also be um, described as graph data. But I think that most of you uh, have been experienced, have, uh, have experienced uh, social networks uh, and actually uh, signals on social networks, users on social networks, they can be considered living on a graph, the network graph that underlies uh, the characteristic of this data. So, of course, you can imagine different other applications of graphs, and that will be the aspect of uh, the last uh, section of this talk, how we can use the analytics that, that we will introduce, simple analytics that we will introduce to solve quite complicated problems on uh, graphs. So before I, I continue, I would like to introduce some things about graphs. What do we refer, what do we call a graph, right? Uh, and what are characteristics and types of uh, such graphs? So first of all, a graph, it's typically denoted with a capital italic letter, sometimes G or any other italic letter, and then a capital italic letter, and then we define a graph as a set as a group, as a group of vertices, or alias nodes, and edges. Edges are connection between nodes. So you see here, this is a graph. You see here with V, the set of nodes, the group of nodes, the, the, the class, the, 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 con, the, the set of nodes. You see here, this is a node. That's another node, that's another node. You see that this graph here has five nodes. And this graph has edges, connections between nodes, all right? This describes a graph. Um, and you see here uh, an example of such a graph. You can already imagine that how such a graph can encode the information of a social network. Uh, you can see here people. This node can be a person. And that node can be another person, can be another profile. 
and the connection here means, for instance, that this node is, or this prof profile of this user is following, is connected with the other node, right? Or is, is friends with another node, if we can say. Correct? So this creates a graph. Okay? So we have different types of graphs. These are a little bit mathematical terms, let's say, but all these mathematical terms, they construct the notion of analytics, which, we'll ca which we can use later on to apply <coughs> on graphs, and therefore to derive uh, interesting properties and interesting applications. But bear in mind that in order to do so, we need to, first of all, introduce the different types of graphs. Different types of graphs, graphs will be using different types of types of applications. For example, we might have directed or undirected graph. I will mention later on what this means. Or we can have weighted and unweighted graphs. Uh, we can also have cyclic and acyclic graphs, as well as combinations of these three categories, which are the main categories of graphs. <coughs> For instance, we can have a graph which is directed, but also unweighted, uh, a graph which is weighted and directed, and acyclic, and so on and so forth. Uh, do you have any idea of, for example, what is a directed versus an undirected graph? No? Sorry, can you? Yes. We could say, for instance, that we can go very simply, we'll see later on the, 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 the terminology, but we can say that if we are in node A, let's say this node, we can go through the edge to node B, uh, but we can also, this is a direction that says that this node is basically, you can go from node A to node B, but you cannot go, for instance, from node B to node A, okay? An undirected graph is a graph that only signifies the connection and not the direction, okay? So, voila, an undirected graph, which is defined as this, consists of a set of nodes and a set of edges connecting the nodes, and there is no direction on the edges. Basically, each edge is an unordered pair of a node and another node. Basically, in very simple words, an undirected graph says that if there is an edge, means that there is a connection between a node VI and a node VJ, where uh, VI and VJ are two different nodes in a network in a graph. Make sense? So, by creating undirected graphs, we can also uh, introduce different interesting um, characteristics. The walk, the trail, the path, and the cycle. A walk is a sequence of edges which join nodes. For instance, uh, this is a walk, this, this set of sequence of edges. For instance, we can say that we are going from V1, uh, V2, V2, V3, and V3, V2. This is a sequence of edges that they connect uh, nodes, right? That's a walk. A trail is, however, a walk that has distinct edges. Namely, we go from V1 to V2, V2 to V4, V4 to V5, and V5 to V2 again. So we have distinct edges in this um, uh, trail. You understood what, what I mean by distinct edges? We have this edge, this edge, this edge, and this edge. An edge is a connection. Because in here, we have an undirected graph, and you saw that in this walk we have 
we, are ha we have this, right? This edge has been visited twice because we did this, this, and this. So this edge here has been visited twice. While in the trail, we went from here, 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 and here. We only visited this edge, this edge, this edge, and this edge once. Yes, but that is another thing. That's a path. So a path is a trail which has distinct vertices or nodes. You see here that if I compare this set with this set, I am missing this extra thing here, which means that I am going from V1 to V2, V2 to V4, V4 to V5, and that's it. So I'm not revisiting again V2. So what you just mentioned is a path. A path is a trail which consists of distinct, therefore, edges and distinct ven vertices, alias, nodes. Okay? A vertex is a node. A vertex is a node. Make sense? And therefore, the last thing that we can consider is a cycle where a cycle is a non-empty trail in which the first and the last nodes are the same. Okay? So, for instance, this is a cycle. It's a non-empty trail, namely a trail which consists of nodes and edges, it's not empty. Uh, and we visit the first and the last node again. All right? So it's not a path because this node has been visited twice. All right? So coming again to the difference between directed and undirected graph, here I'm providing an example of a directed graph. So a directed graph, again with the same notation, uh, is <coughs> consisting of basically edges which are an ordered pair of nodes. Namely, it makes sense whether we write vi comma vj and it's not the same as vj comma vi, all right? The order in which you visit the graph is important, okay? Which means that I can go from node, let's say, vi to node vj, but I cannot go from node vj to node vi because the direction of the graph is like this. This means that the edges have a direction. I can only go from here to here, okay? You can consider, for instance, um, a directed graph as a, st as a network of streets which consists only of one-way streets, right? You cannot go into the other way. While you can consider a city with points and there's no street with one way, but both ways, then you can consider this as an undirected graph, right? There are also what we call weighted and unweighted graphs. And here you can see an example of an unweighted graph. This means that the edges, uh, the connections between the vertices or between the nodes, only signify the existence of a connection and do not signify the importance of such connection. Namely, there is no weight on the edges. We don't say that this connection here is strong by this amount, but we just say that there exists such a connection. Okay, so there, the edges have absolutely no weight. But there are also um, weighted graphs. And these weighted graphs, uh, they basically uh, character, they base, each edge has a certain weight, okay, which encodes some kind of information. Can I ask you uh, an example, for instance, of a weighted and an unweighted graph. What would you consider yourselves as I would use a weighted graph to express this, I, I would use an unweighted graph to express that. What would you um, think of the use of such a graph? Yes, please. As you said before, a set of streets where one street has two lanes, another street has three lanes, or something. A big avenue. Like the large capacities of cars yeah. that can pass. Yes, for example, 
Exam yes. For instance, if we had the information, if we had the information on the number of cars that might be passing from the street, uh, this could be the weight of that connection, right? The weight can also be the speed. The weight can also be the amount of rain that uh, is basically uh, is basically. Uh, has been thrown uh, in a number of days. It can be an information that can be encoded in the form of a weight, okay? So that's the, that's the idea, okay? So basically using these mathematical notations, the mathematical notions, you can represent information. You can encode information. Now, there are also other characteristics of graphs, uh, for instance, cyclic and acyclic uh, graphs. A cyclic graph, again, is defined by a set of nodes and a set of vertices. But what happens in a cyclic graph is that we, we have cycles. Okay? So we can see, basically, the creation of a cycle inside the graph. You see, by a cycle, I mean, if you go back some, sli some set of slides, you see it's a non-empty trail in which the first and the last nodes are the same. Okay, that's a cycle. If a cycle exists in a graph, then we call the graph a cyclic graph. You can see here, for instance, that I have a cycle in this graph because I am in this node, and by following the directions, of the edges, I can create a cycle. A cycle means that I am from this node and I can go into another node, right? And again, G could be directed or undirected. Is this a, an example of a directed or an undirected graph? This is a directed cyclic graph and actually a weighted directed cyclic graph. Right? This graph is acyclic. So there is, at least in this graph, there is no cycle that has been created. Could you say why? Well, it's obvious, but it's basically because this is a, a directed graph, and you see the direction here does not allow you to, to close the circle, right? It's, I signified it here with the green color. Uh, the existence of the direction like that and not like that as before. Before we had the direction from this node to that node, which would allow to create a cycle. It would allow to go back to this node. Here, because the direction is the opposite, we cannot go from this node to that node. Therefore, we cannot create a cycle in the graph. And therefore, our graph is an acyclic <laughs> graph. Okay. There are, are there any questions so far? OK. We have also very other, uh, another set, another important set of graphs. Uh, and these are called bipartite graphs. In bipartite graphs, again, we have a set of vertices, uh, these ones here, and a set of edges, connections. but the nodes or the vertices can be actually divided into two distinct and uh, disjoint sets. Let's call them U, that's the set U, and that's the set V. Okay? And those two different sets, they are disjoint in the sense that always an edge goes from one node uh, in the set U to another node in the set V. In other words, there are no edges that connect nodes of the same group. Hmm? I don't have an edge that connects this with this directly. Neither this with that, nor this with that. Okay? And the same thing here. You can see that in a bi bipartite graph, we only have two sets of nodes, and there are only connections, edges, between the different 
uh, groups, not in, in bit, uh, not in nodes in each of these groups. So, what do, how do we, um, how do, can we create extra notation, extra, extra nomenclature in graphs? We need to introduce notions like adjacency, um, is, uh, incidence, and degree. We can say that two nodes are called adjacent hmm, or neighboring, that's the meaning of adjacent, if they are connected by an edge. So you can say that this node and this node, they are connected using this edge. Therefore, these nodes are adjacent. Uh, an edge is called incident with a node if the node is an end node of the edge of the edge so for instance this edge now is an incident of this node because it's connected to this node in fact or this node is an end point of this edge and the degree of the node uh, denoted by this notation here is the number of edges incident to that node could you tell me what is the degree of each node here so what about this node? What's the degree of this node? Three. Three. And what about this one? And this one? Exactly. So that's the idea, all right? And we can say that these two nodes are adjacent, these two nodes are adjacent, but this one and this one are not adjacent, okay? Sure? Adjacent, adjacency is, first of all, the concept of adjacency here uh, is, it's, is basically defines connection. However, when you construct a graph, adjacency is something that it's a rule that you impose, how you create adjacency. For instance, you can say that two streets or two locations two geographical locations, they are adjacent if they are closer or they have a distance smaller than this, than so many kilometers. So the way that you create adjacency, namely the way that you connect two nodes, is something that you impose to construct your graph based on your application. Okay? So the adjacency, what I mean by adjacency here, is something completely abstract for the notion of our graphs. However, we can, and it's up to ourselves to say how we can create adjacency, all right? To give you an example, we could construct a graph of nodes, a family tree. An adjacency could mean whether a node A is connected with the first degree as family association with a node B. Right? That could be an uh, adjacency. Depends on how you construct your graph, what actually, in reality, adjacency means. Make sense? Now, we will go a little bit, uh, not a lot, but because we are referring to analytics, we have to introduce also some analytical terms. So when we, when we discuss about analytics, we, are, we have to be ready to uh, understand some, or at least to, uh, to, to um, follow some mathematical concepts. Now, you can ask me, all right, and this is, a, this is a nice figure, Nikos. How do we express this, this figure into a mathematical term and in a term that can be understood by a computer? I cannot really take a picture of this and then give it to a computer and a computer understands uh, that this is a graph, right? I need to express it in terms of bits and bytes. One way to express a graph is through the adjacency matrix. The adjacency matrix uh, is a two-dimensional tensor, hmm? is a matrix, 
which has, if, if the graph has, let's say, n nodes, n capital nodes, or n capital uh, vertices, uh, as we call the nodes, then the dimension of this matrix, of this tensor, will be n times n, right? For example, you see here that I have in this graph eight vertices, eight nodes, and the size of my adjacency matrix is 8 times 8, right? I see that the matrix is actually very simply ex explaining uh, which node is linked to which node in the matrix. So it's like Absolutely. That's exactly what this adjacency matrix means. The, it's actually, this is a specific adjacency matrix for undirected graphs. If we have other types of graphs, we will have different forms of an adjacency matrix. You can see that an adjacency matrix for undirected graphs has is, is, is binary. So basically, it's, uh, it takes as inputs either a 0 or an 1. Um, and 0 signifies no connection, no adjacency between two nodes. And then one signifies the existence of an adjacency, of a connection between two nodes. So you can say that this is node 1, node 2, node 3, node 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. This one here says, and again, this is node 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. This one here says that node 1 is connected with node 2, but, it, but the 0 here says that node 1 is not connected with node 3. I guess this is the case, right? So node 1 is actually only connected, node 1, with node 2. In this second row, you see that node 1, sorry, node 2, this node, is connected with node 1, node 3, and node 6. All right? Excuse me? With this representation, you can connect to yourself? With, with if I would connect with myself, if node 1 would connect to itself, what would you observe in this matrix? One in the top left corner. Yeah. One not on, yes. If, if, there was, if node 1 was connected to itself, you would see one in the top left corner here. And basically, if all of them were connected to themselves, <coughs> you would see an one in the first diagonal everywhere. And because no one is connected to itself, you see everywhere zero in the first diagonal. First diagonal, I mean this diagonal of the matrix, right? Yes. Yeah, this is the characteristic. Because this graph is undirected, this matrix is symmetric. <coughs> it means that the upper, le the upper diagonal of the matrix, this part, is the mirroring of the lower diagonal of the matrix. If I fold the matrix in two, if I take this and I fold it like a, you know, a piece of paper around the first diagonal, then you would immediately see that these elements will be the same. You see this one here is also appearing in here. This one is also appearing in here. This one in here. And this one also appears in, uh, if I recall correctly, here, right? So the mirroring, that means symmetric. And that's because the graph is undirected. There's no direction in the graph, all right? Question to you. If I sum all the elements per row or per column, because it's the same, what would I receive? What would I get? I would get, if I, if I sum all of this, row by row, I will get here an 1, here I will get a 3, here I will get a 4, here I will get a 2, 2, 4, 3, 1. What, what would I get? Basically the degree per node, right? You remember that the degree of a node is the number of edges incident to that node, right?
So that's the adjacency matrix for an undirected graph. It's a binary symmetric matrix. If I have, however, an unweighted and directed graph, if I have a directed graph with no weights on the edges, then you can see, I have here a simpler uh, graph, you can see that node, the, the, the matrix is now binary because it's unweighted, but because it's directed, the matrix is now non-symmetric. This means that if I fold the matrix as, as before, the elements will not correspond. Uh, and, you, and you'll see here why. So node 1, node 1 is connected with node 2, and node 2 is also connected with node 1, right? Um, here, node 1 is connected with node 4, and the same thing here. I'm trying to find for a connection which is not uh, the other way around. So 2 and 4, I guess. 2 is connected with 4, but 4 is not connected with 2, you see? So basically, you can observe here that this matrix is not anymore symmetric. So this one is here, but this is a 0 here, and here we have a 1. What do I mean symmetric is that along the first diagonal, that's the first diagonal, the mirroring elements should be the same. But in here, it's not, they are not the same because the graph is directed. Okay? In the previous graph, the elements across the first diagonal, the mirroring elements across the first diagonal, they are uh, exactly the same. Yes? It doesn't matter. How does it matter? Like if someone say the, the direction is to the roof, the node from the column to the roof to the node to the column changes the direction. Uh, you, have to, you have to define them if I understand this question. Is it the standard or is there like whatever in the code paper that you say that you have to read it that way? So if you read it the other way, Uh, well, negative direction, right? It's just a mirror. Yeah, yeah it's it's, uh, it's. If we take the uh, matrix here, we can say that the reading from the pro perspective, we say that the first node has no connection with the itself, and then has a connection to the, uh, the node two in the direction from one to two. But if we say that it's two to one reading from from the row, it's changing the direction. So I just want to understand if there is a convention uh, about direction and order of reading the matches. We can say that uh, there is uh, the first row. And okay. You could say that. OK. okay. Uh, then there is a weighted and directed graph. So a weighted and directed graph is basically uh, a matrix which will be not anymore uh, symmetric because it's directed, but there will also be uh, weights, and this means that the matrix will not any anymore be binary, but um, basically we will have the weight of the connection here, all right? For instance, you can see that 1 to 2, there is a weight 5. And from 2 to, from two to 1, there is a connection um, of 3. OK? Basically, is a, is a way that you, that you express, express your graph. Uh, it, it, it has to do with what you, uh, you encode in the matrix, right? Now, apart from the fact that you have uh, a graph, okay, you can also have 
signals that live on nodes of a graph. For example, if we have a social network, if we had a social network, okay, and we had each node here representing a profile in a social network, we might of course have connections here which express the if this, this profile is connected to that profile by friendship, by following, by retweeting or by uh, forwarding an, a, a message. But also this node here represents, as I said, a profile and this profile has information, it has uh, te text, tweets, uh, photos on Facebook, etc. All of this information of such a node can form a signal okay can form data in the form of a vector in the form of a matrix in the form of structural and structured data as we saw them uh, in the previous um, set of lectures where we were talking about structured and unstructured data okay for instance if you if we had twitter uh, users if this is a node on twitter this f here could be depending of course on the application that we are working on could be the locations of this user, the locations of the tweets that he has posted. Or it could be the text of, what, of the tweets that the user has posted. Okay? If we had uh, road networks, this could be, for instance, different types of buildings that they live on a street, and the F could be characteristics or tip, uh, or, or information about, um, for example, uh, buildings on streets. Okay, so the signal here, F, are information about the nodes, whatever you would like to encode as information about the nodes. And the edge here encodes the connection between two different nodes and characteristics of this connection. For instance, the number of cars in, in a, that they pass between two different buildings that they might be connected because they are on the same street. Okay? And for instance, this here can express the price of, of this house, for example. You might have houses that they are connected because they are on the same street or because they are on the same street and also they don't, um, they don't have a distance of more than X, for example, 100 meters. And this F here could express the value of such houses or the characteristics of, that, of, that, of, of such houses in terms of number of rooms, in terms of height, in terms of uh, condition, and so on and so forth. All right? So basically, um, that's a discrete signal on a graph. And um, we can apply specific analytics on these signals in what we call spectral domain uh, in the transform domain namely and these analytics can be applied on these graph signals are you aware of any signal processing uh, principles have you ever heard about the Fourier transform or something like that or the wavelet transform not really uh, okay, it's not a big deal in any case. I'm just going to express some simple mathematical notations just to introduce you in what is there, out there. Uh, for the people that they are interested in this kind of things, you can feel free to go and um, dig deeper uh, to see what's, what's available and what, uh, what, is, uh, what is there. But the purpose of this talk is to stay still on an airplane view of what it is possible with signals on graphs and for the interesting people uh, there will be I guess no, uh, another set of lectures for more advanced um, people that for more advanced uh, uh, people that are already introduced in the basics of machine learning and signal processing and they can follow this, this, uh, these approaches. So another very important in order to apply uh, analytics on uh, graphs we need to introduce some very important 
elements, some very important operators of the graph signals and of the structure in graphs. And the fundamental operator uh, is the graph Laplacian. So Laplace was a mathematician and he has also uh, given his name in a distribution, the Laplace distribution, which is an exponential form of a distribution. But he has also given his name in this very beautiful um, formalism about, about um, graphs. So what is the Laplacian of a graph? Let's suppose that we have a graph which is undirected, right? Then the, as you can see here, there's no direction in the graph. The unnormalized graph Laplacian is a subtraction between the adjacency matrix, sorry, between the degree matrix uh, D and the adjacency matrix A. What's the degree matrix? The degree matrix is a matrix which consists again of n times n elements, where n is the number of uh, nodes in the graph. And in the first diagonal of this matrix, you just write the number of the degree of every node. For instance, you see here that the degree of node 1 is 1. The degree of node uh, 2 is 3, right? 1, 2, 3 here. Let me get my pointer. So the, the degree of node 3 Sorry, the degree of node 2 is 3, 1, 2, 3. The degree of node 3 is 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on and so forth. Basically, the degree matrix encodes in the first diagonal the um, number, the degree of its, of its node. The adjacency matrix is what we already saw. If you subtract the degree, sorry, the adjacency matrix from the degree matrix, then you will observe what we, s we call the operator, the Laplacian of a graph. Okay, it's an operator that has been used, that can be used in analytics of graphs. Just on, on that point, so what does that really tell you? And I, I'll give you a, a real concrete example. So a group of tennis players, some know one person and play with it. One person, some play with more than one person. So what does the, uh, the difference So it tells you, um, it basically re extracts the adjacency characteristics from the degree, okay? Yeah, and no, then no, you no, can no. use... So what does that say to you? In other words, is it better if the population is a lower? Because there's a the degree in the age and the adjacency are the same, so the answer is zero. And of course, getting to zero, is that a better network? Uh, the, the Laplacian is basically ex extracting or represents the graph. Yeah, but that doesn't tell you anything about it. Oh, yes, it tells you. It tells you everything about the graph. Okay. It tells you how many nodes it has. Yeah. It's the dimension of the, of the Laplacian. It, knows, it tells you what are the connections, where are connections. It also tells you what are the weights of its connection, and it also tells you what are the um, the number or the degree of every uh, node, right? So the the Laplacian extra ex explains everything about the graph. But you mentioned weight. You know weight here. It's just weight Well, this graph does not have a weight, but if it had the weight then it would be in the adjacency matrix. Now you see, if I, if, I have, if I have an undirected graph and I sum the rows here, I can get the degree. But if I had here the number of weights and I sum the rows, I don't get the degree. I only get what? So, so you see what, what I'm trying to say? that the Laplacian is basically encoding everything about the graph. It's an operator that encodes everything about the graph 
uh, and can be used to apply analytics on this graph. It's representing the graph with one matrix. No, would not be zero. No. Now, because the Laplacian will be another matrix, and the degree here, the elements. So, here you see, let me show you a, an example of a Laplacian, and maybe you will see it because it cannot be, it cannot be zero, okay? Can I have zero. No. It means that the degree matrix is exactly the same as the adjacency matrix if it's zero. And it cannot be that the degree matrix. No, because if every node is connected with all the other nodes... No, it's just to one node. So it's a circle that has no interconnections. Well, any, in, in any case, it will not be zero because these are two different matrices that they have two different form. This is a matrix which, is, which has, only, has only elements in the first diagonal. And this has elements everywhere, not only in the first diagonal. It's not possible that I subtract this from this and I get a zero. It's impossible. Unless, I mean, there are no connections in the adjacency. It, it, it is really not something that I... I mean, I can try to find the case, but I, I, I don't have it in the... just in my mind, you know. Sorry? Yeah. No, yeah it's, it's, it's an interesting concept because if you're working with social networks, uh, there's something that you can analyze about over time. Yes. The L growing. Yeah. Which means there's more connections, more degrees. Yeah. yeah. Then you can basically using this L here, you can apply analysis on L. And then you can ex understand how your graph will evolve, what are the characteristics of it, and so on and so forth. Is is a method? Is a, is a is an operator of the graph? Excuse me. Yes. So that means that the D is the position that is in D you can infer from the A map. Yeah. For this exam. I, I think people here are trying to go further than you. I think you are you are probably asking about what is what Laplacian is useful for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the that's the yeah. your question. You are trying to introduce Laplacian. But now let's him to say what it's useful for. Yes, as I said, the Laplacian is an operator. Okay, it encodes information about the graph. It expresses the graph with one single matrix. And you can infer immediately elements of that by applying then mathematical uh, functions on this Laplacian. So it's, it's, its value is not in understanding uh, its, its value lies not specifically in understanding properties of the graph, but applying also operations uh, for this Laplacian to uh, understand, for instance, how the graph will evolve or what are the characteristics of the graph and so on and so forth. But is it not enough to, the adjacency matrix is not enough to, to represent completely the graph? Because why, why we need to introduce Laplacian, if we have adjacent tree matrix, that in, in my opinion is, is enough, in, at least in this case. In this case. But as I said, the um, Laplacian is an operator. It represents fully the graph. And as I said, the importance of the Laplacian is not on representing the graph, but on being able to apply operations on the graph. Okay. For example, uh, to apply convolutions on the signals of the graph. 
to understand similarities between graphs. It's a mathematical uh, operator that is required, let's take it as, as granted, uh, in order to introduce, for example, the Fourier transform of, on graphs. Okay, we need that. Okay, but in any case, the Laplacian can also be express the entire graph. Okay. Then um, we can also have the normalized graph Laplacian, in which what we do is that we divide um, the Laplacian with the degree matrix. That's the normalized graph Laplacian, which is very important in order to uh, apply uh, other operations, as we'll see later on. And here you can see, for example, that what I did is that I divided the previous unnormalized Laplacian with the uh, inverse or matrix of the degree matrix. Now, this is an example, uh, for instance, of how we can use the graph Laplacian uh, in operations. Uh, you know, the, the Laplacian is not only describes the graph, but also describes the structure of the graph, the smoothness of the graph. For instance, that how nodes uh, can be um, similar to each other, how the graph has similarities in some parts and non-similarities in other parts, right? How information on this, how the signal, because you know, you, you also have a uh, signal on, uh, on these nodes. You, as we said before, you can have here uh, text, you can have here uh, images, you can have here signals that they leave on the brain as we will see at the end. So here we have some signals and here uh, we have the graph. Okay, so we, we can use the graph Laplacian to apply, therefore, transformations on these on this signals, to apply smoothness constraints, similarity constraints across the signals that they leave on the graph. And, for example, the Laplacian is used in the Laplacian quadratic form, which is basically a smoothness or a total variation constraint on the signals that they leave on the graph. And basically, this is a formulation. Now, this formulation um, is basically telling you how uh, signals that they leave between nodes in the graph, they are close to each other or not. It's a way to express how, for example, how much this, the signal, sorry, the signal that leaves in this node is similar to the signal that lives in that node, okay? Without the graph Laplacian, we are not able to apply such constraints when we analyze, okay? So for example, we have, let's say that we have tweets here, text, and tweets here, text. And you also have connections between those nodes, right? Nodes on social network. Then what would you like to do is for example, let's suppose that we want to predict the, something about the users, whether the users will like uh, a specific movie or a specific product, okay? We know what they say, we, s we know how they are connected, and then we want to apply analytics to predict um, whether they will like, for example, a particular movie. And in order to do that, we, because it's a, it's a problem that requires machine learning, we need to apply smoothness constraints. And smoothness constraints, they, for instance, applied on the signals on the text. So if, for example, people tweet about similar things on their text, we are also um, expecting that they will probably like the same products or they live in the same city, right? So people on Twitter, if they discuss about specific political things and they write almost the same thing, or their texts are very close to each other, right? Are the, aren't they expected to have similar political beliefs or similar, um, uh, similar, uh, yeah, to buy similar products or similar marketing behavior and so on and so forth, right? So using that 
formulation using the graph Laplacian, we can apply smoothness constraints on the graph. We can say, for instance, that if this text is similar to that, those two nodes, I and J, could, could have a similar behavior. All right? So this is a mathematical function that encodes this similarity. <coughs> There is also something quite important uh, in graphs. I will just go uh, through, through it. You know, when we refer to data, uh, we typically do not process or apply machine learning methods in, in data uh, in, the, in the signal domain or in the domain of, the, of the, where the signal is, on the text directly or on the image directly. But we apply transformations or uh, representations of data in different domains. Here, this is also the case. When we have signals on graphs, then we can express these signals in another domain. And the most particular domain is the Fourier transform. Basically, um, it expresses the Fourier transform how um, frequently the signal changes across the graph, OK? Uh, you don't have to really uh, follow all the mathematical notation. I'm just trying to explain to you what is the reason of, um, of a representation. What is the characteristic of a representation? Um, let's suppose that you have an image, right? Uh, let's suppose that you take an image of me now that you are looking at me. Then what you observe is pixels, numbers of, you know, every element, every pixel has a characteristic number, right? If you take this matrix, this photo, and you transform it in another domain, for example, the Fourier domain, what you will you observe is how fast your signal changes in particular locations, okay? So if you take a picture of me right now, you will see that the signal it has some elements, uh, the background, uh, this, this thing here, this the world here, that doesn't change a lot. So the frequency of the signal in that particular dimension is very small. Um, while in other elements of the signal, the, the signal changes very rapidly. And that expresses you, with you, to you, the um, how the signal changes. So basically, uh, the Fourier transform is, is applied similarly on graphs. It's a, it's a mathematical transformation. It's a mathematical function that apply, is applied on data and changes the notion of the data. Okay? It basically brings you from one domain to another mathematical representation. And you can go back. If you see the signal either in the original domain, let's say, in the original representation, or in the representation in the, in the Fourier transform or in another transformation, you can go back from one to the other, all right? And uh, the same thing applies with graphs. If you have uh, this graph Laplacian, then you can extract what we call uh, its eigenvectors. This is uh, another mathematical characteristic of this. And then you can also uh, I extract these eigenvalues, and you can write your graph Laplacian in the form of this mathematical expression. Then, by multiplying this with your graph signal, then you obtain the graph Fourier transform. And by multiplying your graph, your, your Fourier transform uh, coefficients with this part of the Laplacian uh, um, decomposition, then you obtain back, you go back. Uh, to your signal. Here you see you obtain the x from the inverse signal. So what I would like from you, uh, what I would like you to keep from this uh, slide, which I know that it's a little bit complicated for many of you uh, and it might uh, uh, look completely unreasonable, uh, I want you to, to understand one thing, that when we apply analytics on signals, 
we typically do not apply these analytics on the actual signal itself. But what we do is that we transform the signal in another domain that typically expresses how fast the signal changes, the frequency of, of, of change. Okay. For instance, Yeah, we go to another domain by applying uh, indeed a transformation with the form of with some basis functions. A, a basis functions is a functions that they they consist of orthonormal uh, vectors. Namely, if I multiply, uh, you see here this 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 u here consists of vectors, and these vectors are orthonormal. What does this mean? Is that if I multiply this one, if I take the inner product of this one with itself. Then it gives you the identity matrix, the identity uh, one, sorry, one. If I multiply this with this, if I the inner product with this and this, then I get a zero. So basically, what my transformation is doing is that it expresses to me my signal on these vectors. It tells me that my signal can be created by taking. So it's a decomposition. Yes. Exactly. Like voilà. Yeah. Exactly. The only thing that is changing is that this decomposition respects, takes into account that the signal lives on the graph. And this information that the signal lives on the graph is encoded using the graph Laplacian, the, the L. And the L expresses basically everything about the signal. So you take the L in one matrix, you decompose it with this decomposition with the transformation and you are able then by using um, this use this this is a matrix eh? a matrix consists of column of, of um, columns that they are the eigenvectors eh? the principal components of the building blocks of your signal so what this transform is doing is that breaks your signal into building blocks, into components, and each one of these components has a weight when it constructs your signal. You say, for instance, that you know that uh, we know we say that the human body consists of I know 70% uh, water and then 30% something else and I don't know 25% something else, etc. We can say that this signal consists of this percent of this vector, this percent of this vector, and so on and so forth. It's the, it's, it breaks your signal, your data, into principal components. And then you operate using, you, ap you, you apply your analytics using these principal components, and these are here the weights that tell you how much of this principal component should I take. The recipe. The recipe, exactly. So this is the, let's say, the ingredients. And this is of how much of the ingredient you should use. So like, We will see now examples of how we can use this. OK? So the way that I approach this is by saying, what are the different types of graphs? How can we use? operators uh, for graphs, especially the Laplacian of a graph, which is an operator that is being used then for in analytics. And then I tell you that using the graph Laplacian, I can decompose a graph into its building elements. And then I can use these building elements to apply analytics. OK? And then let's see some examples of uh, analytics. And a, a very, very small um, thing uh, 
a very important thing, of course, is that by using these elements, I can apply what I call convolutions. I don't know if you have ever heard about convolutions before, but the convolution is, is um, how should I say it in very simple terms? A convolution, you can see it as a, as a moving filter, mm? as a moving operation across your signal. It goes through, your, it, it, it scans your signal. And it basically um, multiplies your signal with weights and extracts a specific uh, characteristic. Okay? So a convolution is basically uh, an operation that applies on your, it's a scanner on your signal. Okay? You can see it like that. And basically convolution and filtering, convolution is uh, what we do in filtering. Yeah? It's exactly the same thing, but I'm just trying to give the, a very, very abstract notion for people that they're not introduced in filtering. Okay, but yeah, convolution is how we apply filtering in the signal domain. Because in the transformation domain, we are multiplying the filter kernel with the uh, sig the, the, the transform signal, okay? The transformation of the filter kernel with the transformation of the filter signal. All right. So now let's go to the second part, which is how we can use what we understood before, uh, what, what we introduced before, to apply simple machine learning operations on graphs w coupled with particular applications which we will see at the end of the presentation. So do you remember, for those that uh, were with us in the previous um, time, we discussed about clustering algorithms as a particular category of uh, unsupervised learning. I don't know if you recall that. All right, so what, what we do in clustering we try to find similarities between elements, um, between data, right? Uh, say, for instance, uh, and in order to apply uh, clustering, we need to have a distance metric. So to be able to express, to see how we can calculate, how we can uh, obtain how we can compute similarity okay for example we can say that two people could be grouped together if they wear the same color of the shirt right if their shirt has the same color then this should be uh, they are similar this is a similarity metric but typically uh, one of the most important similarity metrics is the Euclidean distance or the L2 norm okay you remember what is the Euclidean distance? No. Nope. So what is the distance between a point A and the point B? I'll write it. What's the Euclidean distance between point A and point B? Well, it's just that, eh? which is equal to well, it's square root of. Four, yeah, two square, plus four square, square root of 20. Okay, that's the Euclidean distance. Elias, the L2 norm. Okay. So basically, that, that is the Euclidean distance. So, so basically, uh, in the two dimensions, we can say that these two uh, 
signals A and B, they are together, they are close to each other or they are far from each other, where the metric is this distance here, right? The Euclidean distance. So what we want to do is using, for instance, such a distance to group together points, right? In the two-dimensional space for this example, but we could also have more, much more dimensions, where the dimensions could signify, for instance, the features, right? So, and another thing that we need to have in order to cluster, we need to have the amount of clusters, at least in k, in, in k means. There are other algorithms for which we do not, know to, we do not need to know um, the number of clusters. So what do I mean by clustering is if I have data like this, right, and data like this, and like this, you can see that based, for instance, on the Euclidean distance, I could say that these data are grouped together, and this data are, is grouped together, and this data is also grouped together. Make sense? I have three different clusters, one, two, and three. And a basic algorithm that uh, has been used to solve this problem of clustering is called the k-means, okay? I don't know if you have heard about k-means before. Some of you might have heard about it. Hans? <laughs> okay, then I will just go through it very fast, if you don't mind, right? So how does this, that this k-means works? It's basically, in k-means, what we want to achieve is that we want to group together data and at the same time to find the center of gravity, okay, which is basically the center uh, of all of these points. So how do we apply the algorithm? We start from random centers. We start from random uh, red centers, right? Random, completely random. And then we calculate the distance uh, from each point to uh, the data that we have and we try to group the data that they are closest to this point. And then we proceed and we proceed and we proceed. Uh, sorry, after we have calculated the new group, we recalculate the center and then we do this operation again and again and again, right? So basically, to give you a very um, visual characteristic of this. Suppose that you have just coarse points, right? Just, just points on the on a 2D uh, I could start by uh, applying some random centers, randomly. And then I would say that this is basically closer to this, and this is basically closer to this, okay? Then what I will do is that on this group, I will calculate a new center which is the center now of these elements here. So it will be something like this here, and this will be moving somewhere there. Now that I have the new center, I will recalculate again the closer points, and then the new closer points will be something like that, and something like that. And by having this, this I can now recalculate the center. It will give me something like this, and then something like this, say, right? And then you um, immediately saw that my new group is this, and basically this. Okay, so I, I cluster, I, I, I manage to cluster the, this um, data by starting from two random and initial points, okay? That's how a k-means basically operates. But what I didn't do, uh, or what I didn't consider, I didn't consider that this data, well, the, the version of the k-means that I just described to you, First of all, is it clear or would you like to go again through the k-means? Maybe we can do that during the break. 
if you want, right? But basically what I didn't consider in the k-means is that the data might also live on a graph. I didn't take, took into account the um, graph topology in the simple k-means. So what I need to do is to develop a new clustering method that follows the uh, graph topology. And that's what the graph-based clustering is doing. With this kind of method, the spectral clustering, for instance, I am able to um, group together signals that they live on a graph. Okay, that I, can, I am able to group together signals, for instance, tweets, by respecting also whether their users are connected on the graph. Not just by clustering tweets that they might be similar. Do you follow what I'm trying to say? Yeah. All right. So let's suppose that, that you observe a bunch of tweets. OK? You just see a bunch of tweets, line, uh, etc. And I want you to find the three most important topics that they discussed on this bunch of tweets. What are you going to do? Well, you are going to express the text into numbers. Each word can become a number, right? And then each tweet has how many characters? 146 or something like that. Let's say that every character is a number, all right? A is 1 and W is 26, all right? Then you can write a tweet in the form of a 146 vectors and try to find the ones that are most similar using, for example, clustering, correct? Correct? So far, correct. It's an example. Eh? There's no correct or wrong. Now, what, you didn't, what information you didn't use? You used the text. But what is the other information that you could also use? That these tweets are posted by people that might or might not be connected on the social network. So you didn't use the underlying connections, right? By using graph analytics, you are able to rerun, rewrite, re-express these algorithms by taking into account that these texts, these tweets, have, have also additional information. And this additional information is that are posted by people which might be connected or not on the social network. Do you understand me now? Right? So that's the properties. And how you can do that? In the first example where I did not take into account the network, I expressed every tweet as a vector, right? As a signal, F. Okay? In the new method, I need to uh, take into account the graph. So therefore, what I do is that I use the graph Laplacian for the, the calculate the graph Laplacian, and then I apply the transformation, as we discussed before. And I don't anymore group together similar textual representations, but I go from the graph into its transformed version, and I try to find similar transformed versions, and therefore to be able to uh, cluster together uh, users. Is it clear? let's say, from a high level, uh, strategic, conceptual uh, approach. OK? I think we can have a small break now, right? And then uh, I can go through the k-means one more time if you want uh, and see how this, this argument works.
All right. So welcome back. And now we're going to see, for example, how uh, we can uh, express problems um, that you might uh, encounter in what we call recommender systems uh, and how we can encode information uh, like that um, on graphs. So do you know what a recommender system is? Recommender systems are, we saw that before, these are algorithms uh, that they run on uh, products uh, and users, for example, and they are able to recommend specific products to specific users based on their preferences, right? So when you use, for example, Spotify, and the, the system proposes you to listen to specific music based on the music that you have seen before or the people that you're following, this is an application of a recommender system. When you're using Netflix and you're watching uh, movies and the system uh, proposes you to see some of the movies, recommendations as we say, this, this system is running a so-called recommender system algorithm in the back end. The same thing on Facebook or on social media where you are connected uh, with specific users and then they propose you new users to connect to. Uh, basically what happens is that, that you are subject to a recommendation engine that runs specific algorithms and proposes you uh, connections. An example, uh, here we can use uh, what we saw before, namely the bipartite graphs to encode the structure in a recommender system. Imagine, for instance, a system of Amazon or a system of Netflix, which has users and products. For instance, movies or music, uh, uh, different songs. So in this particular example, let's suppose that you have different users and you might also have different movies. And a connection is basically formed by if a user, user one, has seen a specific movie and has rate, rated this movie, then there is a connection. And this connection with the stars that it has provided to the movie, it can give you the weight of this connection, right? Uh, similarly, if user 2 has seen Lord of the Rings and has rated with three stars, then you can see this connection here. So basically, using this, we can write the information that the recommender system can consume in the form of a bipartite graph. And you recall what we called a bipartite graph? A bipartite graph is a graph which consists of two groups of nodes and there's only connections between uh, nodes in this group and only with nodes of the other group. Not nodes between the groups are, uh, nodes in, inside the same group are connected, all right? So this is the formulation of a bipartite graph, and this is an example. So by using this bipartite graph, and for instance, applying convolutions, uh, operations uh, on this graph, we are able to predict uh, what new users will like. Or we are able to predict how many users, for example, will like with some, uh, so many stars this particular movie. And therefore, we are able to recommend this movie to this particular user. So you see here, for example, that we can use for every node in the graph information from the incoming links and we can apply for example algorithms like message passing where we can transfer information from the two uh, groups uh, using iterative algorithms these are called message passing algorithms and by doing that we are able to predict for example if user two um, or three will like a particular uh, movie and therefore to recommend this movie. 
Um, we also have problems like which are called semi-supervised learning problems and such a particular problem is called label propagation. Let us suppose that we have an undirected graph uh, with a few label nodes and we need to predict the labels in the missing nodes, right? So what do we have? Let me give you uh, an example of such a label propagation approach. Let us suppose that these are buildings, these are apartments, and they might be connected, for instance, if they are not far uh, apart by a given distance. Okay? And this plus one here might say whether this apartment is sold or it might be saying that whether this apartment is empty or not. Okay? And using, you know only information about some apartments and you don't know information about the other apartments. And what you want to do is to use this graphical structure here and this correlation to infer whether what happens with the other apartments that you don't know, okay? So you have a graph, you have nodes in the graph. For instance, you might have information about users on a social network. And you might know, for instance, that this is a user that spreads fake news. Uh, and this is a user that does not spread fake news and you don't know what's going on with the other users. And then you can use such an algorithm to predict whether another user will be spreading fake news or whether another user has a certain political belief or a certain user will like uh, certain movies or not, right? So this is what we call label propagation. You have, you have labels particular, in particularly no, particular nodes, you know them, but you don't know the labels in other nodes. And what you want to do is to uh, fill in to find the labels in the, uh, in the rest of the nodes. There are different ways to solve this problem. Is algorithms that do labor propagation themselves, or we can apply graph convolutional neural networks, or we can apply some kind of classification approach with regularization on the graph. And this regularization, what I call regularization, is the constraints that you saw before the smoothness constraints, right? So I want to classify this node here as a plus one or minus one, fake or not fake, bot or not bot. Uh, I know, for example, that these users here, this is a bot, but this is a normal user. And I know the connections in the graph, and I want to classify whether this uh, user here is a bot or not. And based on the connections that I have, on the graph, I can predict whether this user is a, is a bot or not. Okay? That's, that's basically what what's you can do. That is an example, for instance, of a labor propagation algorithm. You have a set, a graph, that's the graph, and you have two different set of <coughs> nodes. Uh, nodes V U and nodes V L. Oops. The the union between these two disjoint sets give you all the the available nodes. Obviously, this is the set of labeled nodes, and this is a set of unlabeled nodes. And the two sets together, they give you all the nodes, right? And then. What you want, what is, the, what is the task is to, you have of course the labels for this set of labeled nodes. For example, you have the labels in A and D, a plus one or minus one, and you don't have labels for node E, B, and C. And you want to use the information on the graph and these labels here to predict these missing L labels here. So the intuition is that adjacent nodes, uh, nodes that they have large weight, 
should also have similar labels, right? If I know that this node A is connected with node B and there is a very large connection between the two because the weight is very high, I can assume safely, safely that this node should have the same label as this node, right? Let's, let's see that this through an example. Let's suppose that these nodes here are social network nodes, users. And let's say that this is a bot and this is not a bot. Or let's say, let's say sorry, this is a top typical user, plus signifies a user, and a minus signifies a bot. You know what is a bot? Or a non-troll and a troll, you know. Um, so let's say that this is a typical user and you see that this user is connected with the other user B. It basically what happens is that this user A posts information and this user B follows this many times. You can assume that if this label here is positive, this should also be positive. If this is an actual user, most probably B should also be an, a, 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 a practic an actual user because I mean, we don't interact so much with bots, right? We don't, I don't think that you really retweet or repost or share many times what bots sent, right? Okay? So that's what this thing is doing. It's basically uh, trying to, to say, okay, if I have this high weight here, this would have a plus here. This would have also a plus here. And you see, because this plus is here, then the weight between, you see the connection between this, let's say in this particular example, I have here a plus and a minus. And I know that this node is connected with this one with a weight 10. And this node is connected with this one with a, with a weight 1. Eh, you can safely expect, uh, uh, say that, well, at least with very high probability, this B here should be plus instead of minus, right? That's the idea of label propagation. And this can happen using mathematical notation, using, in fact, the smoothness constraint that I mentioned to you before of the gra about the graph Laplacian, okay? So basically what I'm saying is that F here, Fi, is the label for node I. Say I is the um, a, a, and J here is the label for this. I want to find this label, but I know that these two labels should be close to each other. That's the smoothness constraint. And there is, of course, <coughs> Um, closed form harmonic solution for this particular problem, but I don't think that this is neither the, the right venue, neither the right time to go through the harmonic solution uh, for this particular problem. So let, let me go then for the rest uh, of the time that we have. into some particular examples uh, of how people have used this kind of algorithms. So, for example, in social networks, we can use clustering techniques to do community detection. What do I mean by community detection? Is to basically find users that they form a community that they what do I mean by a community that they possibly are interested in the same thing that they discuss similar things that they are f having the same beliefs and so on and so forth so you can extract a set of users from the social network you can query the API of a social network to create such a graph by principles, for instance, uh, if I follow another person, then this means that I am connected with this person. This creates an undirected, um, an unweighted graph. 
and an undirected graph as well. If, for example, how many times have I retweeted or reposted or shared or liked a post of another user, then this might characterize the weight of the graph. This will have an, another graph Laplacian. And using the characteristics of the graph Laplacian, I can then cluster, apply this clustering technique, and I can actually group together um, users. All right? So, yes. So you can apply multiple layers of the weight at the same time? Can, can you be more specific? Yes. Yes. No. So what is the, the feature? That's a very nice question. The feature is what? The features, for example, can be described by this function here. So the connection can be um, whether they are connected or not. And the features can be the expression of this uh, function here. So I can uh, really encode a lot of different types of information, uh, of course. Now, there are also um, studies that they have used the graph uh, signal processing graph analytics to infer the mobility par uh, patterns of users in a big city. Imagine, for instance, that you could classify uh, the mobility pattern, how a person or a, a vehicle moves in the city with different uh, mobility patterns. Let's say, for instance, random, that a, that a person or a car is randomly moving in a city. Potentially, the person is lost. Or uh, straight, there's a car going from one direction to the other, basically crossing the city. Uh, or bidirectional, there can be a car going from home to the office and returning back, right? Um, spreading, so cars that they are going to different directions, or this, or this, this car is basically going outside of the city in a spreading way. And all of this, they create mobility part, uh, patterns. Could you, for example, consider what kind, how could you use, if you, knew, if you would know this kind of mobility part, patterns, how would you use them? Excuse me? Yes, you can, you can, for example, study how citizens move in a city, and then you can do city planning. Uh, you can also identify anomalous behavior in a city and say, for instance, that, yeah, you know, this, this person, uh, something wrong with this person. That is, you know, the, he has some potentially abnormal and maybe illegal behavior. All right? Of course, you can understand. You can use these mo these patterns to do advertisement in a city, or to understand uh, ambient dimension in the city: pollution, uh, temperature, uh, prices of of uh, property in the city, and so on and so forth. Right. So let's see. Obviously, there are many applications, but let's see how they actually did it. So the, for those that they are interested, the, the publication is, is written here. So you can go uh, and you can, if you're interested, read the paper and understand more about it. But I'm just going to give a high level uh, expression of the, uh, of the paper. So what they did is that they divided the area of a city, let's say the considered area, into a grid of locations. Let's say 10 by 10 meters or 5 by 5 meters, right? So you have a map, 
of a city, then you split it into a grid, boxes, right? Small rectangulars. And each of them covers 10 by 10 meters. Then every particular location, the center of this uh, 10 by 10 uh, meters area, basically creates a node on the graph, all right? And then two nodes can be connected if the distance is smaller than a given threshold. And I mean here distance using the Euclidean distance or the uh, Manhattan distance, which is the L1 norm, uh, and so on and so forth. So then what these guys did is that they basically for every user, they consider the number of photos that this user is uh, posting on Flickr at different location. And then this would, this would cre create a signal on the considered graph, right? So a user is basically moving across the, 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 node, the nodes and if it passes through a node or how many times it passes or how much time it stays into that node can be expressed by the number of photos that it has taken, that has posted on Flickr, or uh, the number of um, posts on social media that it has done from this particular location, right? And therefore, and, and therefore uh, using this signal, you can apply the analytics that we just saw before, and you um, and they can make very nice visualizations of how people are moving in the city. And you see this uh, on this slide. So basically on the, on the left uh, part of the slide, you see the aggregated uh, number of distinct uh, Flickr users that have taken a photo at different locations in the central London uh, between January 2010 and, and June 2020. And in fact, what you see is that the size and the color of the, of the um, spheres here indicate the number of distinct users associated with these geographical locations, all right? So uh, if you see um, if the size of this bolt here is, is large, uh, circle here is large, then this basically uh, tells you uh, how many different users were in that area. And uh, here you see on the right the, the different class labels of the mobility partners, the, the pattern, sorry, in London. The colors green, yellow, orange, and red represent random, spreading, straight, and bidirectional patterns, respectively. I don't know if someone of you have, has actually lived in, uh, in London. Uh, if that's the case, you can raise your hand. Uh, I've lived in London for two years. Uh, amazing experience. So let's see. What's the random pattern? It's, well, very much in the center, right? Uh, well, there are many, many things in London that you can get completely uh, random about it in the center. Yeah, you, for instance, yeah. For instance, this is very interesting. But if you are, for example, in the center, you can see tourists that they have a random walk uh, in the center of the city. Or if you are in areas like the city uh, where you have people that they are just moving to their, uh, to their job, you can have a straight or a bidirectional uh, behavior. And then you basically using big data, using Flickr, you are able to understand the mobility partners, patterns, sorry, without actually having a sensor at every human being trying to analyze its patterns, right? Now, another uh, very cool application of graphs is in uh, traffic forecasting. And by traffic, I mean that, for example, you want to forecast the speed in a given street segment um, using, for example, historical data and using the road network. 
and you want to predict, uh, for example, what will be the average speed that cars will be traversing a given road in a given um, time instance in the future, for example. What's the intuition behind this approach is that there is special dependency. And by special dependency, I mean that because of, you know, if there is a street that it is um, congested, then most probably streets that they are adjacent to that street are also going to be congested eventually. Uh, so traffic at nearby location tends to be similar, right? And then also there is temporal dependencies. Uh, a traffic at a specific location also forms a time series. You can, for example, assume that on Mondays at 10 o'clock a particular street could be uh, congested because the same amount of people they're going to, to their jobs, right? So this is some kind of temporal dependency there. So what is the solution? Uh, the researchers have, and, and again here you can uh, see the paper that I'm referring to. Uh, you can go to the, to the slides of the presentation and then immediately uh, to find the papers and if you're interested you can go through them. So what did the researchers do is that um, they used graph convolutional filters uh, combined with, for instance, neural networks that they capture time characteristics, and these are recurrent neural networks, and they travel to they, they try to, to model the dynamics of the traffic flow, and also capture the spatial and the temporal dependencies. Right. So, so they used they created a graph based on locations that they are connected using the street network, and then they used um, convolutional filters uh, to express a special dependency and they also used recurrent neural networks networks or, or machine learning tools that they understand the temporal dependency to express and in fact the temporal correlation so yeah the, these are some visualizations of, of um, interesting papers uh, and then you see, for example, uh, on the left, a loop detector covering the freeway network of Seattle. And there's another data set that is covering the downtown Seattle area. So basically, these are visualizations of data that they are available on the web. If you are interested in this kind of problems, for example, there are available data. There is available data that you can download and play with, for example, from INRIX. And this is basically a visualization of the solution. You have here the street network, uh, which encodes the connection between different locations by the street network. And this expresses you the spatial correlation. So this, let's say, road segment or this particular location in the, in the, in the city is connected with this other particular location because uh, there is a street and they are close to each other uh, and so on and so forth and here you have time so what the researchers did is that they applied they took this structure which changed across time obviously and they applied you know uh, analytics on this to be able to predict the traffic uh, across time in different locations ideas So every slice like this is basically telling you a location, another location, and here you can have, for example, the, the connection says that these two locations are close to each other and they are on the same, for instance, street segment. And the weight here can tell you what is the speed, right? And then you're trying to calculate the speed uh, across time for these streets, for example.
Any questions? No? Yes, please. Yeah, you can do two things. First of all, you can, as you correctly said, forecast. So basically, you have the measure, the, you have the information in this net, in this time instance, in this time instance, in this time instance, and then you want to predict what is going to happen in the next hour, right? But you could also say that I have. I'm not interested in predicting the future, but I'm interested in, sorry, but I'm interested in knowing what's going on in the city. For instance, you are able to measure the traffic in some locations, but you don't know the traffic in other locations, right? Um, another application has to do with um, neural imaging on graphs. And what is neural imaging on graphs? Is that you try to investigate and visualize the functional brain networks. So basically, machine learning and data analytics can, can be used in order to analyze the brain signals. All right. Um, and typically, because you know, it's the brain signals are very hard to understand and very hard to capture with physical models. People have been resorting towards signal processing and machine learning solutions. And for example, they try to to capture with these uh, this net with these graphical representations non-trivial topological properties, and they try, for instance, to quantify a dysfunction and malfunction of a human brain. To say, for instance, that, you know, based on the measurements that I do, this part seems to be not working correctly. Um, so what these researchers are doing is that they try to, to study the potential of integrating the brain structure, how the neurons in the brain are connected to each other, but also the brain function, how the signal in the brain transfers uh, across the different uh, brain cells. All right? So you, the brain cells are the nodes. The connections are which the edges are the connections between brain cells. Right. This is, for instance, a, a pipeline of a neural imaging on graphs. Uh, it's a pipeline of functional brain uh, networks modeling and analysis. You see, for example, here you have sensors uh, with electrodes. Uh, you have the electro electrogephalography, where you put nodes uh, on the on the um, human. Um, head and you measure uh, these kind of signals. Then, based on these brain recorded signals, you can create some kind of connectivity matrix. Uh, and then, all this information using uh, thresholds and statistical topologies, you can write this in, the ter in, in terms of a graph. And then, by applying specific algorithms on the graph, you are able to do visualizations of which cells are healthy and which cells are diseased or they have a, a problem. Or you can try to understand whether some neurons are active uh, and therefore you are resting, or there are neurons that they are firing, they are doing something, and then you are able to understand, for instance, what these people are doing, only based on the, on the activity to understand if they are doing a specific task. All right? So this is a classification problem. Right? And the, the important thing is that 
you are able by measuring the signals to understand uh, the graph uh, behind. Many researchers actually saying that uh, neural neuroimaging could be a killer application for graph signal processing mm -hmm. because it can really bring new results in this domain. And this is a, a nice, a nice uh, visualization of the track, um, tractography of the cells uh, in the brain and how the brain graph can be created. Uh, I want to give you the um, heads up. I'm not an expert in brain, in brain imaging um, by no means. Uh, but of course, this is a very, very interesting application to um, to consider with a lot of important um, benefits for the for the society. Now there are, uh, you know, um, other applications of, of graph uh, signals, uh, and some of them is, for instance, in um, three in in, mil in media uh, in multimedia. You know, for instance, that uh, in gaming, hmm, when you play, ga I don't know how many of you play uh, video games, uh, but you know video games are constructed by 3D structures, for example, and when you have these graphics, 3D graphics, then you need to be able to understand shapes, 3D shapes, right? And to be able to classify different shapes or to be able to, um, to find the most similar shape with another shape, right? So the solution is to represent its 3D shape as a mess. A mess is, again, a form of uh, edges and vertices. And basically, formulate the problem as classification. Try to map its vertex uh, in the query shape to one of the points in the reference shape. And for example, you could use uh, a, a graph convolutional neural network, as we saw before, to, to, do the, um, to do the classification. And you see at the bottom of the slide here, you can see uh, the paper that, that you can use to, to refer to if you are interested. Um, this is, for example, uh, a visual expression of what I'm trying to say. You have you have um, the leftmost image, which is the reference shape. And you might, for example, to find areas of that shape that they are very similar with other shapes here. Uh, basically, its graph signals uh, can be used here to encode the structure of this 3D shape. And for example, to tell you to apply tasks like classification, to say, for instance, that this is a human. Or uh, if you have another shape, to, to say that this is an animal. Or this is a, I don't know, a car, right? Or a vehicle. Yes? You can still compare it, of course, because you are not comparing uh, that's a very inter very nice question, because you are not comparing them in the, as I said here, you can use the graph convolutional neural network as a classifier. So because you are not comparing in the actual graph domain, but you do this transformation to another domain, you are able, for instance, to compare signals or graphs that they have completely different structure and completely different. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Right? That's why you're doing this transformation, as a matter of fact, right? That's the, that's the reason. You can even compare completely different shapes, or to try to find similar shapes, or similar elements, uh, similar, similar arms across different shapes, for instance. Uh, another interesting um, form of a signal is um, point cloud signals. I don't know if you know about point clouds, 
but uh, what are point clouds are have you seen this uh, do you know what the lidar is or or this this um, uh, light sensors basically what they measure is you have a sensor and it measures the time that a photon needs to to, to travel to a specific um, obstacle and come back right so you can are able with this kind of sensors to understand the distance of um, objects from the camera so you know if I take a pic if I take if I use a sensor you I can sense the 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 distance of the closest object to the camera in a given viewpoint right so these will create what we call point clouds because basically they will tell you in what they will give you the location in the 3d space of a particular of a particular um, point um, you know this kind of, of, of sensors are very very much used in the new generation of self-driving cars where you apply you use these sensors on the top of the car or in the in the um, left or right of the car to be able to see what are the surroundings where are, what are the the closest uh, obstacles uh, or objects right now let's suppose that that we have this kind of um, point clouds and then we want to classify 3d objects into one of the of predefined classes to say for instance that this that this object that we see in front of us is actually a car or is a pedestrian uh, or is a bicycle etc so what we are doing is that we construct a directed graph with nodes corresponding to the points and edges corresponding connecting sorry each point to its spatial neighbors and then we can use for example convolutional neural networks to directly learn the high level representations of the graph and predict a label for the whole point cloud or for parts of the point cloud basically these are examples of uh, a point cloud from um, a data set which is available it's called the Sydney urban data set you see for instance uh, this is a point cloud that represents a car right obviously but a computer if it's what we'll see a computer is just points right and connections to the closest as I said here the computer will see um, a see a directed graph with nodes corresponding to the points and edges connecting its point to its special neighbors so for instance this node here is connected for example to this, this to this to this neighbors and this will construct some kind of a graph that the form of this graph the characteristics of this graph will be different for a car and for a pedestrian okay and then you can you can see that by using these methods you can say you can classify that this is a car this is a car this is a car another type of car but you can see that those structures here are similar compared to this structure okay you are you you are basically using the properties of the of the graphs to be able to understand similarities latent dimensions across the different points okay uh, so basically I don't know what this this thing is but I guess it's, it's uh, some kind of a building uh, ah yeah might be uh, traffic signals yeah this can be a um, crane or something yeah, yeah. good Uh, you can also uh, apply this kind of methods to do what we call 
uh, point cloud segmentation. So what is point cloud segmentation? Is that we want to segment points um, of point clouds into groups according to context. Uh, I think it will be clear if I show you the, 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 the thing here. For instance, you know there are companies that they are interested in understanding the dynamics of a plane or the dynamics of a Formula One car, right? And they want to understand that this is basically um, this is basically the part of the airplane and this is basically the, the tail of the airplane and these are the wings of the airplane. So you want to split the, the, the shape here, the 3D shape into different, um, into different distinct uh, parts. For instance, you have here your um, headphones and then you can say oh, the, this is the, the part that uh, groups them together, puts them together and these are the different parts that you put on your ears, left, right, and so on and so forth. So you basically use this kind of algorithms to, to segment, to split uh, an object into different parts. So how you do that? Um, first of all, again, you construct the uh, graphs using 3D clouds. And then you use graph convolutional neural networks to classify each of the points into a predefined set of groups. And at the same time, you can perform classification over the whole point graph. And the idea is that each point, there is a training set, a supervised learning problem, where you have, for every point there, you have a label. And what you do is that you try to do, to, pr to apply this label, um, to predict the label uh, using the function that you have, right? So you train such a function into available data, uh, into using labels, and then you apply a new uh, formulation, a new, a new object, and you try to run the algorithm to give you its, um, its point to, to have, to, class, to, to, sorry, to classify it in the right category. So using the first Yeah, that's a very, very nice question. The first labels are created by experts. For example, if there are experts that they, that they do analytics um, on, that they, that they run analysis models uh, on, the, um, on the planes, they do, there are experts that they go and they very, very finely grained, they create, they, 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 they go every point and they say, this should be a point of the wing, this should be a point of the tail, this should be the, the, a point of the front rear of the, of the airplane. Okay, this is a very painstaking task. And that's why you want the machine learning algorithm to immediately do a first, let's say, segmentation, and then you have the expert only to correct if there is something wrong. Yeah, wrong. Yes. Well, another interesting application is to try to predict human actions, uh, but using um, to basically take videos of people and try to extract from the video a rough skeleton. So the skeleton by something like that. So what they do is that they have a video, for say, of, or let's say of a, of a person that is walking. And then they create market, they put markers on, on, the, on the person and try to extract points of interest. So as to construct what we call a human skeleton, right? Uh, and then this creates a graph. And you see they, they monitor this, these videos and they learn to predict what is the next action that this person will take, will do, right? How, how this graph of points of the human body uh, change across time, they use this graph convolutional neural networks across time to predict what is the next action that this skeleton 
this moving skeleton will actually perform. Okay? Does it work? Excuse me? Does it work? Yeah, well, quite well, <laughs> I would say. Roland Garros? Roland Ah, yeah, exactly, exactly. It could be used for uh, analysis of tennis players uh, to see um, uh, or, or, or basketball players or, or football players, athletes in general, to see uh, how they could be optimizing, for example, uh, their moves. Yes, that would be a very interesting application. And the last application that I would like to, to present you is uh, also quite interesting, I would say. They use graph analytics to perform building pattern classification. So you have, you have images from satellites, uh, see for instance Google Maps, and what you want to do is to classify whether a building is, is a complex mall or whether a building is uh, a house or whether a building is a house with an extra uh, store, uh, storage place attached and so on and so forth. They try to create, to classify from the, from the satellite imaging types of buildings or patterns of buildings, right? So what do they do is that they uh, construct a graph for each node representing a building in, certain, in a certain area. And again, as I said, they use machine learning models to classify each one of them. I think this will be clear if you see the, um, this visualization. You see here, uh, let's say, a neighborhood, right? And you see in this neighborhood different buildings. And what you try to do is using algorithms like minimum spanning trees or um, Delaunay triangulation to try to understand what are the types of the buildings that you have or the patterns of the buildings that you have, right? To say, for instance, that this is a big building uh, or this is a house and so on and so forth, right? So you construct um, stores, so you, sorry, you construct graphs and then you are applying analysis on these uh, graphs and by doing so, they were able to really nicely um, see, for instance, uh, buildings that they were not used or buildings that they were a regular group of buildings. Uh, you see here uh, a regular group of building or any regular group of building and so on and so forth, right? And then um, don't ask me where they are using these kind of things. It's a cool application, but I, I guess there are several, um, several interesting applications for this. I think this will uh, conclude uh, today's uh, talk, and I would like to welcome uh, questions of yours. Uh, do you have any question about what has been delivered today and uh, how you can use it? And um, is there any, any specific question that you might have? No? Yes, please. Uh, to do uh, ratings or suggestions of films or films we watch, is there another way than a graph? Because you know, doing it is quite complex. Okay. Are there other tools? Sure. Like very simple. They are very. Well, the idea is that you also program and implement this in a few days. <laughs> uh, but um, there are different uh, levels of complexity in the recommendation engines. Uh, you can very easily uh, think of some. Uh, for example, let's suppose that you have a number of users and a number of movies, right? Mm -hmm. And let's say that you have characteristics for every user. If it is a male or a female, uh, what is the age category that he or she belongs to? 
then you can use this information to find similar other users. Huh? And say, for instance, that this user is, uh, is similar in five or has the same five out of ten metrics. Then you can say with a weight of one or five divided by ten, it will give the same rating. That's a very simple, let's say, nearest neighbor approach to solve the recommender systems problem. But there are different levels. Yes. Yes. Sure. Yeah. That's a very simple. Yeah. That's that's a, let's say, a basic approach to address this problem. Yes. Uh, it's a LinkedIn on Facebook. If you want more in this group, there is a lot of good to do some big to pay in some subset of some questions to make the calculation faster. What they can do from the full matrix. That's another very interesting question. So, when the data dimensionality increase, increases dramatically, then you need to run this, this type of algorithms in a distributed fashion. Namely, to split the calculations in a smart way across different machines. Uh, that's how they do it. They use principles of distributed computing to split the operation in the cloud. Your, your, your answer, the answer to your question is Consider how, for example, Google is crawling the entire web when you are giving a keyword. It does it very, very fast. And it doesn't go only to some web pages in, in Belgium, for example. It goes to all the web pages, right? There are algorithms uh, and technology that enable you this to scale up. If this answers your, your question, let's say. Excuse me, can you, can you? It's always in a rough, we know that a node for a person in the case is a rough that not have more than seven years of connection, like this that kind of connection that you do it in a algorithm, or it's always all the possible connection with all the other possible nodes more? Well, this is up to you. Is it depends on how you construct your graph. The different, the, the different ways that you're going to construct your graph will have different implications in the algorithm that you should use, in the complexity of the algorithm, and in, of course in the result that you will obtain. That's, that's your, as a, as a scientist, as a machine learning engineer, it is your choice. Right? That's, that's interesting. Um, again, it depends. So there are solutions that, that they account for the noise in the data. Uh, or there are solutions that they account for the incomplete data. That, For instance, you saw label propagation, where we had some labels and we wanted to predict the missing labels, right? So. Uh, of course, if you have a way to clean your data before applying your machine learning algorithm, it is always, let's say, a benefit, an advantage. I don't know if this answers your question. Okay, so unless there is anything else, 
I would like to thank you for, for your time and for your um, attention, and I look forward to further interactions. Thank you. Thank you.